I'm Ann Junker. I'm currently the vice principal and incoming uh, principal designate at the UBC Emeritus College. I will be making introductions and facilitating transitions for this meeting, which is hosted in partnership with three BC universities, Simon Fraser University, the University of Victoria, and UBC. Please see the Zoom meeting housekeeping details. The webinar is being recorded. Please use the Zoom Q&A box to ask questions when the time comes. We will only be monitoring the Zoom chat for comments related to technical issues. And a French translation is available by using the interpretation button. Here are details of the planned four-part program. Welcoming remarks will be made by Just Blum, the UBC Emeritus College Principal, Kent Percival, President of CURAC, and Santa Ono, President of UBC. Dr. John Halliwell, editor of the World Happiness Report, will provide the keynote presentation, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. There will be a brief CURAC awards ceremony. And finally, after a break, a panel discussion on wellness and well being as we grow older with Dr. Ann Martin Matthews, Dr. Angela Brooks Wilson, and Dr. Gloria Gutman, again with the opportunity for you to ask questions. I now introduce Jos Blum, principal of the Emeritus College, to welcome you to the conference. Joost could not be here in person today as he is unfortunately at a lovely little cafe in Paris with unreliable internet connection. Joost. Hello everyone. I'm Joost Blom, Professor Emeritus of Law and Principal of the UBC Emeritus College. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you today to the Cure Act 2022 conference on behalf of our local organizing committee which is drawn from the Emeritus College, from the Simon Fraser University Retirees Association, and from the University of Victoria Retirees Association. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by acknowledging that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to note that you in our audience are joining us today from many places near and far, and we acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I really regret that I can't deliver this welcome to you live uh, because of a conflicting meeting that's uh, got in the way. Planning for the CURAC annual conference, which it was uh, supposed to be, began this time last year. This was meant to be the restored in-person conference that we originally planned to be held in Vancouver in May 2020, and that had to be cancelled, of course, because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, by September of last year, it had become clear that history was repeating itself and that planning an in-person conference for May 2022 just involved too many risks given the ongoing issues caused, still caused by the pandemic. So with the agreement of the CURAC Board of Directors, uh, the event was changed to today's virtual assembly. The theme for the virtual assembly is wellness and well-being as we grow older. It reflects the mission shared by all the retiree associations that are members of CURAC to make their individual members' retirement years as happy, interesting, and fulfilling as possible. Working at a university in many ways is a privileged career, and the advantages of that career continue during our retirement. CURAC's member associations are ideally placed to be community leaders in exploring successful retirement strategies. And today's conference brings together experts who will share their experience and ideas as to what those strategies can be. I would like to give our warmest thanks to our conference sponsors, who are also CURAC Affinity Partners, Economical Insurance, Hearing Life, 
Johnson Insurance and RTO, ERO, Group Insurance. I'd also like to thank all the members of the local organizing committee that is drawn from our three associations, and in particular, the program team, which was headed up by Carolyn Gilbert. I'd also like to thank the CURAC Board's Committee on Conferences, chaired by Jeanette Lamontagne for their assistance. And I'd also like to thank uh, the UBC Emeritus College office staff for their great organizational support, Sandra von Arc, Christina Girardi, and Mia Riley. Thank you, everyone, and please enjoy today's conference. Perhaps now uh, we should uh, introduce Santa Ono, president of UBC, who has been tremendously supportive of our Emeritus College and Emeriti in general. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, but on behalf of UBC, I'd like to welcome you to CURAC 2022. It's always an honor to address former faculty members and I deeply appreciate the many contribution of UBC Emeritus College members. Their enthusiasm and support for the university is inspiring. Later today, you will have a panel discussion on wellness and well-being as we grow older. And I'm sure that I won't be betraying any secrets when I say that research shows that staying involved and active through your university is a major contribution to wellness and well-being. Thank you everyone for your involvement and your contributions. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable conference. I now invite Ken Craig to the stage to introduce our keynote presentation by Dr. John Helliwell. Thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure to introduce my distinguished colleague at UBC, Professor John Helliwell. John is Professor Emeritus of Economics of the Vancouver School of Economics a distinguished fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and editor of the World Happiness Report. John is a true Vancouverite, having been born in Vancouver, enjoying a long career as a student and then faculty member at the University of British Columbia. But the impact of his scholarly work has been global and is highly relevant to all of us. He uses measures of subjective well-being to help understand what makes lives better with special attention to social factors. John's scholarly career has also been distinguished by outstanding public service. Time does not allow enumeration of all his contributions, but briefly he has contributed notably to Royal Commissions on Banking and Finance, Taxation, and National Passenger Transportation, and served as a fellow senior consultant in, or in other capacities to the Bank of Canada and senior banks in other countries, the OECD and numerous government, academic, scientific and professional organizations around the world. This includes service at the highest levels to the Consumers Association of Canada, the Canadian Economics Association, the Econometric Society, the Institute for Research on Public Policy, and the International Positive Psychology Association. And I've said nothing about his deep commitment to local community service. In keeping with his remarkable career, John has received many notable honors and awards, ranging from status as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford to Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, several honorary doctorates from Canadian universities, and investiture as an officer of the Order of Canada. I very much look forward to John's observations on the theme of happiness as we continue to grow older. Please put questions in the Q&A box and I will moderate them after John's finished. John, over to you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Craig. I'm going to try and now uh, share my screen. Just give you some slides. Are you getting that coming through okay? Great. Wonderful. Uh, it's lovely to talk to so many colleagues past and, and continuing. I've been three years, as been said, that we've been planning this meeting and shifting it around in, uh, 
in location and structure. Uh, I'm happy uh, to be with you this morning speaking from the ancestral lands of the Comox people here on Hornby Island. I'm hoping that this communication form will work and look forward to your questions uh, through the question box. The science of well-being has come a long way in the last 20 years. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor of it. I think the uh, logo on the top left of the screen is the World Happiness Report logo. Uh, this year marked the 10th World Happiness Report. The first one came about uh, in preparation for a high level meeting at the United Nations in uh, April of 2012, itself pursuant to a UN resolution of 2011, sponsored by the uh, Prime Minister of Bhutan, uh, to make happiness and well being a focus of national policy attention in all countries. Uh, in order to provide some background for that meeting, uh, Jeffrey Sachs and Richard Laird and I edited, uh, essentially put together the first World Happiness Report. And uh, since the, the receipt of that was uh, impressive enough in, in demanding more, uh, we've since moved first to every 18 months and now to uh, once a year, uh, making 2022 the 10th report. I'm going to tell you some things from that report, but also from the science of well being itself, which was already uh, in substantial order and uh, is bigger now. Let me start with uh, I say there are three lessons I'm going to give you. Uh, that have come out of this literature. The first one is the importance of the social context. Uh, <clears throat> and you'll, you'll see it's true at every age of life, but it's especially important uh, above normal retirement ages. Most of us know the, the, the retirement age itself is an artificial construct. Uh, you're as retired essentially as you want to be. These figures here, the line bars, are what we get when we take, I have to give you a moment on what happiness is, uh, because we use happiness quite deliberately in a double sense in the World Happiness Report. If we called this the World Wellbeing Report, we would wouldn't get the many millions of viewers we do get. However, when you call it the World Happiness Report, uh, people are then gonna come in and say, well, happiness is ephemeral and it's how you feel and that can't capture all the aspects of a whole life. We use happiness both ways. So we measure in the Gallup World Poll, measure happiness, how happy were you yesterday? Where well, that's an emotional response. The international rankings we do and the modeling I'm gonna to present to you are not based on happiness yesterday, the emotion. They're responses to a question, think about your life as a whole with the worst possible life as a zero, and the best is a 10. How would you rate your life today? And of course, one of the things that rose right to the top of everyone's interest early on was the huge differences across countries. And indeed, we find substantial differences across regions and between cities and rural areas within a country. But the international differences are extreme. At various countries, the averages are up what close to eight out of 10. And in the least happy countries, they're down at the level of three. So these are huge differences we're talking about. These blue bars on the first slide are about the relative importance of a number of variables we use to explain differences in national averages over time and across countries. So we're covering now roughly uh, 2005 through 2021, uh, 2020 in this picture. Uh, and uh, 
for about 150 countries. So a lot of experience now continually. We found that the biggest effect here is coming from, do you have someone to count on in times of trouble? Called count on friends there. Freedom, do you have a sense of freedom to make your key life decisions? Institutional trust is an average of measures of people's trust in various instruments, the government as a whole and the judiciary and so on. Donation is a simple question. Have you donated in the last uh, 30 days? Income, log HH income is the logarithm of average GDP per capita across countries. Perceptions of corruption, it's another measure of trust. It's a, do you think corruption is a, a serious problem in business and government? It's the average of the two and it's negative. Do you have a health problem? That is also negative. Age comes in, I'll give you more on age as we move along. Uh, but uh, typically <clears throat> under 30s are the happiest and the uh, over 60s in many countries are as happy as the under 30s implying, of course, a midlife trough because the excluded category here is people between 30 and 60. Uh, females typically have higher life evaluations uh, uh, than males by that amount. COVID-19 at the bottom, this was the real surprise in last year's report, World Happiness Report 2021, issued now 14 months ago. We found that in the first year of COVID, Life evaluations were almost unchanged in almost every country, despite the huge turmoil to people's lives. And part of what we have been explaining through here is, in fact, the difference between emotional responses and overall life evaluations. And of course, we need to show and to say what it is that's allowed people to be as resilient as they have been in their life evaluations. So that was the lesson one, the importance of the social context. Lesson two uh, is that the positives matter more than the absence of negatives. And uh, the figure I've used, the data I've used to show this for you here is the output from a very nice uh, survey that was done by the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation, they were running a world risk survey uh, through the Gallup menu, and I was asked to help them put this together. And I said, you're asking about harm, likelihood of harm from mental issues, likelihood of harm from violent crime, and there are another other likelihoods of bad things happening. And uh, I said, why should risk only be looking at bad things? Why shouldn't you look at the risk, the chance of something good happening? If you're interested in people's well-being, you want to know how damaged that is if they're subject to bad things, but you also would like to know, uh, especially if you, like me, <laughs> come at this as a member of the Positive Psychology Association, you, you want to make sure the positives are measured as well for their impact on the quality of life. So we convinced them to use a question that was uh, developed uh, at UBC uh, late in the last century when we were starting an equality uh, security and community uh, survey uh, for well-being and other things in Canada. And I think it was Dick Johnson who said, uh, you know, that traditional trust question, do you think people can in general be trusted or not? It's too vague. We should have something more precise. So we worked out the following question. We said, if you lost your wallet with $200 in it, how likely is it to be returned if it was found by, and we gave people alternative finders, a stranger, a, a neighbor, a police officer, or a clerk in a normal in a, in a local store, and we found very substantial effects uh, differing across, depended where you live, it depended on a whole range of things, but it was a very important determinant of people's well being. There's a history of how that question has gone global in the in this succeeding 20 years, but the 
particular form that was used in the Gallup World Poll is almost exactly the form we used originally uh, in this Canadian survey. And uh, so people were asked all over the world in a uh, in this Lloyd's Register Foundation poll, how likely is it you know, they, because a wallet is not used everywhere, it was an item of considerable value to you uh, was lost. How likely is it to be returned if found by a police officer, uh, a stranger or a neighbor? And you're seeing down below there the answers uh, to that. So that people who think uh, that a wallet return if found by a neighbor as a stranger is very likely. You see that 0 0.619, that's almost half a point on that 10 point scale. Now these are all being measured at the same time. So if you also think it's very likely if your wallet was found by a police officer that it was returned. You add those two together, it's more than a full point on your uh, well-being to feel you're in a community where other people are going to watch your back. And so it's not just trust that people will do what they say they will do. It's a belief, a trust that you live in a society where people care about each other. That's enormously supportive for your well-being. The sum of those two things is way more than the effect you'll see from it being very likely that you'll have harm from mental health issues in the next year. Very likely that you'll have harm from violent crime. So the, this positive is very much more important than these are negative matters of some size. And current unemployment, you can see actually being unemployed is one of the biggest identified uh, downers uh, to subjective well-being. And it's about half a point. So the lift you get from feeling in a supportive, connected environment is that much greater. Now then, the next stage in this wallet story is that uh, the Toronto Star, without understanding, oh, I didn't tell you, we, we had this question in the earliest survey in, the, in Canada. We were then able to persuade Statistics Canada to add the wallet question to the general social survey. So we had more than 20,000 people of, as part of the general social survey asked this same wallet question. So then we Independent of all this, the Toronto Star dropped 20 wallets all over Toronto, and 80% 80, 80 of them were returned. You can see the actual stranger there, this is on the right-hand bar, that's the number of returned. Big standard, that's the 95% confidence interval you're seeing uh, on, on the right. It's a big confidence interval because it was only 20 wallets that were being dropped, but you can see it ain't zero. And the, re, the survey, the general social survey, we then took all the people who lived in Toronto and responding to this survey, and the average expectation that a stranger, and of course, strangers were only people who found these experimentally dropped wallets, uh, was a quarter. And the likelihood of people's expectations about the generosity of others being correct is about one in eight billion. So what this is telling us, A, from the previous slide, it really matters to you to think you live in a society where people care for each other in this way. But people very much underestimate the extent of other people's kindness. And of course, that's uh, collectively shooting ourselves in the foot uh, to not understand the generosity of those around us, because if we do understand it, uh, then we'll feel a lot better and we'll ourselves be more likely to act this way, more likely to treat a, someone a stranger on the street as a friend we haven't met rather than somebody who portends evil for us or others. So then, a sec, we've got this. All right, I, I was gonna give you a, a I'll, I'll come back to this trust thing later on. But I also wanted to say, and this is an important thing, that uh, 
especially people worry, and there's some Robert Putnam in the U.S. had evidence suggesting that diverse communities were not as trusting as more homogeneous communities. And so this was some work by uh, Dick Johnson and others uh, way back uh, using uh, the data from this survey I started out by discussing to look at how much people trusted other people in terms of this wallet question in communities of different racial structures. So then you see, we knew where people lived, so we could then use the census data to establish the nature of the communities in which people, people lived. And you'll see that the Putnam result, which is that dropping down, uh, applies to people who don't talk to their neighbors. So the people who are unconnected with the neighbors are the ones who then are less likely to reach out and help them. And that likelihood is even greater in a community where you feel in the you feel less connected to the other people. And often people's social identities, the people they feel close to, relate to people like them. They start with family and friends, and then they only become broader with these positive social connections. So you see in the communities where people do talk to neighbors, uh, that effect that was made much more of in the literature uh, essentially disappears. So social connections not only create happiness for individuals, they carry happier and better connected uh, and, 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 and less disputatious communities. Okay, uh, just a sec, have I, have I got to the right place? Yes, so now we're getting, because after all, this is about uh, in wellness uh, as we get older in part, uh, it's a, it pays to look at what is special about different age groups. So here, and this is using that same uh, general social survey in Canadian data, we look at people who have a strong sense of community belonging and a weak sense of community belonging. And you can see the strong sense of belonging are the people at different ages, the light blue line at the top, and the weak sense of community belonging is a lower line, the dark blue line. Well, you can see at every age, the effect of having a sense of community belonging uh, is, uh, it's, it's huge. It's uh, uh, more or less 0 0.6, 0 0.7 on the 10 point scale. You can see for both people who have a strong sense of belonging and people who don't, that there's a U-shape in age. So the people start out very happy as, as they're younger, and then that gets to be lower in midlife. We find, for example, people who have a balanced life uh, between work and non-work activities, that U-shape is a lot flatter. I'll talk about other things that do it as well. But you can see the U-shape in, in age is flatter for those who have a strong sense of community belonging than those who isn't. And so whatever pressures you're under in midlife, if you have a strong sense of community belonging and can keep that up, then you don't go through this midlife low to the same extent. Uh, now, we also find that it's true with um, marriage gives a flatter U shape and uh, you get a flatter U-shape where people have a supervisor at work whom they treat more like a partner than like a boss. And we find the same thing for happiness yesterday. And I'm now going to take you through uh, some happiness and well-being data about the last two years. Uh, and so here I'm switching over to some material I'm pre preparing right now uh, for a meeting in Iceland uh, next month. And it is essentially reporting starting out from a base of the World Happiness Report. 
And so this is what is from the current World Happiness Report. And so uh, it's, it's kind of appropriate since I'll be speaking to a meeting in Iceland, I can show them as you probably already know that the five uh, Nordic countries are in the top 10 and almost always all of them in the top 10 uh, in terms of answers to remember it's this question. It's not our modeling of the question that we're reporting here. It's what people actually report about the quality of their own lives. And then you see the bottom 10. So you once again are seeing the not just what who are the countries at the top and the bottom, but what a big gap it is with those horizontal lines being the 95% uh, confidence region. Uh, I'm working fast here because I want to leave lots of time uh, for questions. I can come back to these if you, if you think there's a need, uh, but I want to slip through quickly first. The... You'll remember my third lesson was the prevalence of generosity around the world. The most striking thing that has come out of the World Happiness Report data this year was an astonishing increase in benevolent acts right around the world. This is true in every <clears throat> region. Gallup poll divides the data and countries into 10 global regions. In every region, there's been a significant increase in 2021. There was a significant increase in helping of strangers in 2020, uh, volunteering and donations, not so much in part because uh, 2020 was even more uh, keeping people out of the circulation and their regular activities. Um, and although the helping of strangers uh, was more prevalent even then, in part because uh, people had that uh, chance. Uh, the, the, the UK uh, government put out a, plea, a, a call for volunteers to deliver groceries and medications to people. Uh, and they, within four days, uh, they had three quarters of a million people volunteering for that. And they were only 250,000 and they cut off the call for volunteers. So that's, if you like, evidence from a specific example in a specific country of this general phenomenon that we're, people are reporting in this uh, survey. Well, given what I've already told you about the extent to which having benevolence around you makes you happier, it also makes you happier if you're a producer of benevolence for others. And so this outflow of benevolence indeed. And of course we have found it in previously studying well-being and the consequence of natural disasters like earthquakes and so on, that this is not new, um, but we didn't know whether COVID was gonna be treated as this kind of natural disaster that in fact brought people together because COVID after all many ways was driving people apart. It was breaking the normal social linkages that people had. And although we did our best to use our, our faces in square screens uh, linked by Zoom as a substitute, we all know it's not the same, uh, but yet nonetheless, people were able to use alternative means. And one of these of course was to simply go out and you were more likely to walk in your neighborhood streets and offer help to your neighbors uh, nearby and more likely to treat strangers as somebody who maybe could use your help. So that's been a very positive element and a big reason why, because of course in the media, uh, and that's why of course, the actual return of wallets is much higher than the expected return. What you hear in the media is all about bad things being done by bad people to other people. And so you get the, your own expectations are based on whether your own wallet was returned, but most of us don't lose wallets enough to have a very firm view. So it's what you hear about other people from your friends, yes, but also from uh, the social media and conventional uh, news media. So the, the media provide a too pessimistic view about the world. And we know that because people's expectations of wallet return based on those media are more pessimistic than the actual world in which they live. One more wallet question, item of news I can offer you that 
the low people always underestimate the benevolence of others. We now know that's true all over the world. This is not just a Canadian phenomenon because uh, some researchers, once again, not knowing about the survey evidence, drop wallets in 50 countries. And there was a, an article in Science on that. And we were able to take their data about the actual wallet return in 50 countries and correlate it with what the survey said about expected wallet return. And it explained it very well. So there all systematically wrong, but typically the people who are living in a high wallet return country after in Helsinki in the original Reader's Digest experiment, all 10 wallets were returned. Uh, people in Finland expect uh, other people to return uh, their wallets. And of course, that's a key reason why Finland is up at the top of the crop. All right, here I've already hinted at what's on this slide. Uh, the, 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 the blue is the Cantrell ladder. The Cantrell ladder, this is the life evaluation score. So you can see in the Nordic countries, it's seven and a half average. Western European countries, not including them, it's six and a half. All other countries in the world, it's about five and a half. Um, and now we get the wallets actually returned by strangers. Uh, and so this is from that science experiment I was telling you about, uh, highest in the Nordic countries, then in the Western, other Western European countries, and then all other countries. And then from the survey, we get the expected wallets returned per 10 lost. And you can see, looking across these regions, the survey is exactly mimicking what the actual wallet returns were showing. But in all cases, the expectations were too pessimistic. And so uh, that means this is, if you like, an actionable piece of uh, what I'm telling you, that it should be changing your own personal view of the world in which you operate, the streets on which you walk, and the neighbors with whom you connect. Uh, um, I'm aware of the passage of time here, and I want to leave room uh, for questions. I can come back to this. Um, anyway, <laughs> this is a paper, uh, this is obviously I'm speaking to a, a, a joint meeting of Positive Psychology Association where this effect of benevolence is central as a source of happiness, but I'm also speaking to the assembled uh, um, public health scientists of the five Nordic countries. So uh, it then becomes important to talk about uh, COVID. Uh, and so, we mounted for the Lancet uh, Commission, a, a group of researchers, uh, a study of what mental health consequences have been all over the world of COVID-19. So to do this, we combined a, a, a bi-weekly YouGov survey of 15 countries for the first 15 months of the pandemic with the Oxford Tracker Project data on the stringency of policies of various kinds going day by day through the thing. So we were then able to track, and maybe I should, oh, I didn't put the, all right, all right, I, I'm, I'm trimming down. I'm not giving you all of what I'm giving them because uh, I don't have the time and you don't have the patience, I'm sure. Uh, but we did find as other research has suggested, that these stringency measures by keeping people apart did in fact uh, increase the, uh, we have two measures of mental health. One is the positive measure, the Cantrell letter of which I spoke. And the other is this um, measure there's a four item measure of mental health that's used very widely in the mental health or mental illness uh, community. Uh, and it's, it's, it's basically a kind of depression index. And so we found that those, both those measures uh, were lower in the wake of more stringency uh, dynamically. But we also noticed that if you separate countries according to their overall strategy for dealing with COVID between what we call the eliminators, the countries that 
strove to keep uh, community transmission at zero versus those we call mitigators who were trying to keep their hospitals going, but other than that were, were, were willing to take a much higher level of community transmission. So then we could say, let's look not just at the dynamics of this, whereby countries that impose stringency create mental illness or, or less happiness. Uh, let's look at countries that had different strategies. And we found surprisingly to many, and this is a paper that's just come out in Lancet Public Health, that the countries who are eliminators, people say, oh, well, you, you're tearing your country apart and destroying mental health by stringency. The eliminators use these measures very early so they could use them in a better targeted way. So they did lots of tracing and testing. So they knew exactly where the virus was and knew what needed to be doing, done to stop it uh, by early and better focused measures. They were on average able to have less stringency and hence less damage to mental health than the countries that were trying to protect mental health from their economies by not using stringency measures at all. And so you find that people who thought they had a trade off between looking after granny and looking after the economy and were always trying to walk that fine line were making a mistake you could actually save granny. And this was part of what the New Zealand uh, public description of its strategy was at the time. It's not a conflict between granny and the economy. If you do your policy right, you save granny and the economy. So it was actually true that these eliminator countries actually had less unemployment, uh, less drop in economic activity. And of course, as you could see, they had many fewer annual deaths per 100,000. And uh, their life evaluations of the eliminators were lower uh, in those 15 months than it for the mitigators. But we're not telling you what happened before. Those eliminators had a lower average life evaluations in the first pre-pandemic by even more than that gap. So the relative life evaluations rose for the eliminators. And, uh, and there was essentially having the same levels of, uh, of, of the mental ill health measures. And uh, an extra bonus for the uh, uh, eliminators is the survey measures, our survey measures showed that there was a greater public approval for what they were doing. So it isn't as though they were on average having to fight public opinion in order to do this. Well, then, uh, of course, we uh, then focused on uh, the Nordic countries uh, themselves, because a lot of people said, oh, the, your, your sample isn't any good, because you're looking at countries that aren't like ours. Oh, yes, there's Australia and New Zealand in your eliminators, but the rest are all countries that are rigid and more regularly controlled and so on. You need more comparable set of countries. So as a Another test of this hypothesis, we said, all right, let's look within the Nordic countries, which are essentially identical in terms of social structures, you know, the, more or less the six variables we use to explain happiness difference across countries. Uh, they're essentially all up in the top 10 and they all have high values of all of these variables. The only place they differed with respect to COVID-19 is that Sweden quite deliberately adopted a very loose mitigative policy relative to the other Nordic countries. So we call the other Nordic countries, um, uh, they weren't, none of them were in the eliminator group, but they were in near eliminators. They, they, they were, they combined high social trust, which is a very great producer of deaths under COVID by other research I haven't shown you. Uh, so that the, uh, these same measures we were looking at in the previous slide for the mitigators and eliminators, I'm now digging into the mitigators and saying, well, let's look at Sweden compared to the other Nordics. The Nordics as a whole did much better than the other countries. Uh, and Sweden here, you could see annual deaths, it's, it's five times what they were in the other Nordic countries. Did they gain anything back for it? 
Well, not really. The stringency uh, was actually higher on average in Sweden than the other countries. Why? Because although they had much less early on, in the end, they were forced into higher levels of stringency uh, to deal with what they had. And of course, they had less public approval of the pandemic and uh, the lower levels of life satisfaction and roughly similar levels of uh, mental distress. Well, I've given you my three important points at the beginning, and then I've taken you into some applied uh, well-being analysis. I'd like to turn, please, uh, to deal with your questions at this time. Thank you, John. Uh, most interesting presentation. It's easy to see why you're so enthusiastic about it. There's such a Pandora's box of information coming out here. Um, I'd like to thank CURAC is contributing to this supportive, uh, constructive environment for academic uh, college and university retirees uh, across Canada. That's great. And he also give us some very practical advice as to how we can uh, make ourselves feel better later in the day, we have to go out and engage in some kind of a benevolent act. Um, but I see a, a number of questions are coming in on our Q&A, so I, I think I'll uh, turn to them and uh, have, have ask you. Uh, Pomerantz asks, how do you distinguish between cause and effect? E.g., if happy people are more likely to volunteer, how do you tell the positive effect of volunteering? Well, that's that's what social science is all about, Paul, isn't it? Uh, the thing about this, most of the sources of well-being is that they are bidirectional in causation inherently. And of course, that's what makes them so wonderful. I mean, I was as I was presenting the data, I was already inviting Paul's question because not only does living in that environment, a, a, a pro-social environment, make you happier, it makes you more likely to be pro-social yourself. And so there's a feedback loop that's going on. It's what is a classic win-win uh, situation. And so uh, there are a variety of ways of running quasi-natural experiments. And in, in positive psychology, of course, there are many people doing uh, more deliberate lab-focused experiments. So they're actually going out and, and having some people in a benevolent situation and others not, and actually looking at the difference of well-being, then they start with people under different preconditions of well-being and put them in the same uh, circumstance. And so uh, you, there's a variety of ways of, of actually running experiments to show uh, for each one of these propositions uh, where there is Caus causality in both directions, split it open. And um, it, in some sense, the, the more positive the thing and, and the more uh, bi-directional it is, the harder it is to assign the, so you say, well, if we know it's good for well-being and it's, it's, it's good in itself, then you, experimentally open doors in different ways, and then you'll start to tease out gradually which kinds of environment are more productive of well-being, and to what extent is pro-sociality one of the levers and one of the channels through which these better connected societies um, become happier. Thanks, John. Uh, I see David Holmes and Francis Gray have asked essentially the same question. Uh, how does Canada rate and how has that changed over the years? Well, those are the same. Okay. It's not the same as Paul's question. It's the same as yeah. each is asking a similar question. Right. Uh, it, it's an interesting phenomenon because we measure these and by the ratings of people themselves 
rating their lives. Canada started out as fifth and is now 15th. And that's uh, a significant drop over the last, uh, you know, in terms of actual level, uh, not a huge one out of the 150 countries. And uh, often Canada, we compare ourselves to the United States. And so Canada and the United States have both dropped over this period. The United States from 11th to 16th, after happening, we went from 11th to 20th and is now in the most recent uh, rankings is 16th, while Canada's gone from 5th to 15th. The six variables we use that I remember I started out with my talk uh, to explain international differences on five of the six, Canada's always been higher than the United States. The one where the United States is higher than Canada, of course, is income per capita. But on all the other five, the, the trust, the healthy life expectancy, the sense of freedom, uh, the trust in others, uh, uh, absence of corruption, Canada's been better than the U.S. That's still true by a margin that would put Canada and the U.S. apart. So what's different is that Canadians' perceptions, as in the Gallup poll, of their own sense of uh, how their life is, has dropped relative to what the model says it ought to be. And so in some sense, Canadians are being a little pessimistic about their lives. Now, let me, and I had different hypotheses for this. There's now been much more retrospective evaluation of what we think of as classic uh, aspects, favorable aspects of Canada's multiculturalism and openness and acceptance of diversity and 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 and, and cherishing uh, what otherwise would be regarded and in, in other countries often are regarded as social divides, having a broader social identity. Well, a lot of that has been questioned by residential school issues and and a variety of other issues where people are saying, well, maybe we weren't, maybe we haven't done as good a job as we thought we had. Uh, and so that is, it, it probably feeds back into people's own life evaluation. I don't want to make too much of that because uh, the best measure of life satisfaction in Canada, because the samples are biggest and the, the most uniform uh, uh, surveying, uh, is in the Canadian Community Health Survey. Well, over the last 10 years, those valuation averages have all been almost constant. So now we have a puzzle that the Gallup World Poll is showing this drop that the Canadian Community Health Survey is not showing. So another answer to you, that question is, well, they haven't, uh, The I told you first what you asked about, which is the rankings and maybe why, but then I can come back and say, well, we've got this other research puzzle that in fact, the Canadian Community Health Survey does not show that drop, it shows uh, about a, a constancy including during the COVID years. Thanks, John. Um, I see we have a number of additional, really very interesting questions, but I have a responsibility to end our session at 1025 and it's come to that time. So I'm going to have to thank everyone for their questions. Hope that you'd be able to pose them directly with John uh, yourselves. And uh, now uh, we must transition to the Curac Award Ceremony presented by Kent Weaver. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. My name is Kent Weaver. I'm chair of this year's Curac Awards Committee. The Curac Tribute Award is intended to recognize exceptional contributions and or achievements of retirees to their host institution or to the community. And the six people you're about to meet are all very deserving. We are very pleased that member organizations have taken the opportunity to have their colleagues recognized in this fashion. Please go to the awards page of the CURAC website to read their nomination citations. On behalf of CURAC, I want to congratulate Anne-Marie, David, Ed, Ian, Kathy, and Linda. And now let's hear from our award winners. I 
am deeply honored to be the recipient of a CURAC Tribute Award. I want to give my warmest thanks to our John Lennox, who, by the way, was himself a recipient of such an award fairly recently, not only for nominating me, but for his years of good-natured and conscientious copy editing of our newsletter. I am also very grateful to the URA Executive Committee for having sponsored my nomination, and especially, of course, to CURAC for this wonderful award. Thank you so much. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank CURAC for honoring me with this award. It's a great privilege. And of course, I'd also like to thank the Carlton University Retirees Association, uh, President Susan Nezrala, for nominating me. And I also would like to thank Carlton University for supporting our uh, association over the last 17 years since it was formed. I have to say that whatever I achieved personally as a founding member of our association was the result of a collaborative effort amongst many colleagues and in particular, the vision of Don Wiles, a previous winner of the Curac Award, whose leadership and got our association off the ground. I'd also like to acknowledge Bob Morrison, who co-chaired the local conference organizing committee when we hosted the Curac Conference at Carlton. And Bob and I worked uh, closely together at that time. Finally, I must say that receiving an award for service from a retiree association feels a bit like reading your own obituary, but hopefully I'll still have a few more Curac conferences left in me. Anyway, thank you again. It is an honor to receive a Curac Tribute Award for what has been a wonderful journey with remarkable colleagues. To me, the award also represents an acknowledgement of the tremendous accomplishments of the UBC Emeritus College including a committee which I lead, Transitions to Retirement. As a team, we are working hard to promote the general health and well-being of our retired and soon-to-be-retired colleagues. And we are raising awareness, including challenging ageism, that retired faculty members continue to make exceptional contributions as community service providers, family caregivers, educators, volunteers, scholars, artists, mentors, consultants, lifelong learners, and ambassadors for the university. Thank you and congratulations also to the other recipients of the CURAC Award. I want to thank the College and University Retirees Associations of, of Canada uh, and, and all my good friends at the University of Lethbridge Retired Academic Staff Association for uh, this, this very kind recognition. I am honored to receive the award. It was a great pleasure to work with old colleagues to, uh, to, to improve the operation of, uh, of the Retirement Association. And I am so proud now that my work is done to leave it in good hands under President Leona Jacobs, Vice President Steve Wismath, Treasurer John Paulson, and Secretary Sharon Yannicki. Uh, although retired from the institution, I'm still very proud to be a member and very thankful for this kind recognition. Thank you to Curac for this tribute award. The honor is much appreciated. I would like to thank Mira, the board, and the executive, first for considering me as a nominee for this award, and then for submitting the nomination. Thanks, secondly, to CURAC for selecting me for the award. I'm grateful that my volunteer service to Mira over the six years on the Mira board and several recent years on the Staff Benefits Advisory Committee has proved beneficial to our Mira retiree members and to the McGill wider community, which has played such a large part in my life and still does. It's always a pleasure to serve my fellow colleagues doing my bit to help out whenever needed. Thank you, Mira and Kirak. The Kirak Tribute Award comes as a complete surprise, and all I can say is thank you. Thank you to Kirak for sponsoring this award, and thank you to my fellow members of the University of Manitoba Retirees Association who conspired to submit my nomination. 
I was initially recruited as a member at large, and although I was quite happy to serve in this role, executive members had other ideas and sent assignments my way that kept me part of the organization for a lot longer than I expected. Overall, being part of the U of M Retirees Association executive for the past decade has been a truly enjoyable post-retirement experience. Thank you all. So everybody's going to be awake with that stimulating uh, music. Congratulations to the awardees. And thank you very much uh, to John for uh, a very interesting presentation and Ken for your moderation uh, and all of you for your participation. We're now going to have a break and that's going to be in the neighborhood of three quarters of an hour and resume the conference at 1115 Pacific time. Uh, for an a interesting and highly anticipated panel discussion with three uh, distinguished uh, speakers, Anne Martin Matthews, Angela Brooks Wilson, and Gloria Gutman. Each of the panelists is going to make a short presentation, and then there's going to be a discussion amongst the panelists, and then the opportunity uh, for you to ask questions. So uh, we look forward to resuming uh, the conference at 1115. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our final part of our program in Cure Act 2022. I'm Carolyn Gilbert from UBC, and I'll be your host for this session. I'm privileged to introduce three renowned scholars to talk to us about just a few aspects of our broad topic, wellness and well-being as we grow older. Here with me are Professor Anne Martin Matthews from UBC, Professor Emerita Gloria Gutman from SFU, and Professor Angela Brooks Wilson, who holds appointments at both SFU and UBC. So thanks to you all uh, for joining us today. I know you're very busy, so special thanks. Um, our format will be that each speaker will present a brief talk, after which the other two panelists will be invited to uh, make a comment or, or ask a question. And then we will move on to the second and then third speakers this way. And when we're finished um, with that part, then you will um, be invited to put your questions in the question and answer box on your screen. And we will address those um, to our panelists. And be sure to put who you would like to answer your question when you ask your questions. So um, I will introduce well, I will introduce each speaker just before that person's um, talk. So our first speaker will be Anne Martin Matthews uh, from sociology at UBC. Um, in addition, for the last few years, Anne has served as UBC's associate vice president of health. A big job indeed. When she was the scientific director of the Institute of Aging, which is part of the Canadian Institute of Health Research. She championed creation of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, a national long-term study of more than 50,000 individuals uh, between the ages of 45 and 85 when they were recruited. In fact, some of you may be involved in this study. Anne is also a member of the Board of AgeWell, uh, Canada's unique technology and aging network, which brings people together to develop technologies and services for healthy aging. She holds honorary degrees from Newcastle University in the UK and Memorial University. In recognition of the importance and far reach of her contributions to advancing research on aging, Anne was inducted as an officer of the Order of Canada in 2018. Over a 40 year career, Anne has conducted research on social aspects of aging and health and social care of older people. And today she'll talk about what we mean by old age and whether it's enough to simply say 65 and beyond. And Anna, as we, we let you take over here, 
um, you will know, of course, that much of your audience is well beyond 65. And we're wondering, we know we don't feel the same way as we did at 65. So we wonder what you're going to tell us about that. Uh, what one's been teaching for, for over 40 years. So that's an interesting reflection. Um, delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you. I am on the campus this morning in Vancouver of the, the beautiful Point Grey campus of UBC Vancouver, which is the ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, in particular, in particular the Musqueam First Nation. So I am going to talk to you today about the future aging, some of the challenges and opportunities that we have. And as the next slide will show you, the uh, overall discussion is, is recognizing several basic uh, premise, uh, premises. One, that not only are more people living longer to old age, but we are living longer in old age. And secondly, to recognize that population aging and co-longevity of generations is historically unprecedented. So in unpacking some of those uh, assumptions and premises, I will focus a bit on the demography of aging as context, talk a little about ways of thinking about aging and, and old age and how they have changed, and also some of the opportunities and challenges that we have ahead. The next slide just gives you a quick overview, just a screenshot of some of the many reports from the UN and the WHO over the last number of years, just to give you a sense of how prominent and indeed predominant issues and concerns about population aging are at a global level. And why is this the case? Well, as the next slide shows, we focus on these issues because we recognize that within now a very short period of time, people over age 60 will comprise 22% of the world's population. And 60 is often used as a threshold internationally. So that's important to recognize, not 65, but 60 in global context. And of course, for Canada in particular, we know that the number of people over the age of 60 in the next 30 years will double in number to 10.5, 10.9 million. Uh, as the following slide shows, these developments there are, are unprecedented, pervasive, enduring, and they have profound implications. Unprecedented in that they are without parallel in human history. And indeed, in the 21st century, the pace of aging will be more rapid than it has been in the 20th century. Uh, pervasive in that a global phenomenon, but countries have, are, have very different and lengths of time to prepare for the process of aging and the pace of change differs greatly. And I'll show that in the slide in a moment. Enduring in that there will be no return to the young populations that our ancestors knew. All projections show that population aging, while it will change after the, baby, the wave of the baby boom, it is here to stay. And profound implications for many facets of life. I can't get into all of those in my time today, but I know my colleagues will speak to those issues. So the next slide picks up that point about the worldwide pace of population aging. Just quickly to say that the number of years required or expected for a population age 65 and over to rise from 7% to 14%. That's what's depicted here. And in demographic terms, typically populations where 7% is over the, are over the age of 65, that's considered a younger, a younger population in a nation. Once you reach the threshold of 14% of the population over 65, which Canada did a few years ago, then that's considered an older country. So look here, if you think about the what's needed for a nation to be, begin to anticipate the aging of its population, you'll see that Canada had 65 years to make that transition. Countries with enormous populations, such as China, had merely 26 years. So uh, major implications there for how policies and structures might well be adapted from one country to the next. In the next slide, we get a sense of, as Carolyn alluded in her introduction, to some of the problematics when the, we have the language of 60 or 65. So first of all, as the next couple of bullet points uh, indicate, 
This language homogenizes populations that can easily span 40 or more years in age. The difference between a 40 year old and uh, uh, sorry, a 65 year old and a 105 year old, obviously tremendously different, but they're all captured in that one language. We constantly hear the language of the elderly. The anything is a very homogenizing term. And yet we know we have at least two, if not three generations over the age of 65. In Canada, it is estimated, and this is a dated figure, I haven't been able to find one more current, but we know that at least 10% of the population of those over 65 also have a child who's old over 65. And in reality, many of us have friends, for example, it might be a 73 year old with a parent who's 101, or a 67 year old with two parents in their 90s still living, a gang, both generations being captured in that one language, one nomenclature. The next couple of bullets on this slide just refer to the fact that whatever language we use, young, old, older, old, deep, old age, et cetera, they all differ, these generations differ in characteristics, <laughs> expectations, health behaviors, and health beliefs. And we have emerging new family roles and relationships, such as great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, the concept of a retired child with living parents, et cetera. Uh, these are all relevant in this context. Uh, the next slide actually just reflect some of these numbers that I've told you, just to give you a sense of when we look over this period of 35 years up to 2040, what the growth in percentage terms of each of these age, uh, different age categories over 65 will be. And we'll see enormous variations in the estimated growth in percentage. The next slide shows us in millions when we just focus on the population age 80 and over. And this is capturing over a hundred year estimations from 1950 to 2050. Again, extraordinary growth in the actual numbers of people in the population over the age of 80. I often say in my own home, you don't even get interesting till you're at least age 80. So forget 65. Um, now you might say, what does it really matter? You're talking about someone 65 or over 80. Do these differences actually have impact in any way? The next slide actually shows you what I think we would all agree is a photograph of a very robust, vigorous man at age 67. And when you contrast that with the next photo taken some years later when he was age 79, even when you allow, and please bring up the, the, the next image, even if you allow, obviously for some differences in camera angle and just focus, it's too bad they're not more comparable. Nevertheless, you see that for most single individuals, the most robust among us will experience physiological changes from 67 to 79. So I think that captures when we talk about the challenges of treating all of these different ages with uh, capturing them under the one label. The next slide, I think, will lead us nicely into a consideration of what uh, Dr. Brooks Wilson will be talking about, because this concept of super agers, these, these, first you see here an image of a text that actually talks about the 100 year life, how we have to start thinking about that, Pro provocative articles on what would it be like to still be working at age 100. And then finally, for those of you who are, who are interested in the notion of super agers, Dr. Nir Barzilai has a wonderful website of the research that he's doing in this area. The next slide takes us to considering when we talk about these demographic changes over time, that we've actually had real changes in uh, social sciences and biomedical sciences in some of our ways of thinking about aging. So in about 1976, when I was beginning my own career, for example, in the Handbook of Aging and the Social Sciences, just in the section C of the subject index, you went from Canada to Chile. Now, some among you may realize that there's a concept missing there, a concept that's been listed in the handbook in every edition since the 1980s. And the answer is in the next bullet point to come up, the concept of caregiving. And it's astonishing when we think how ubiquitous the language of caregiving is today when we talk about family and, and intra and intergenerational ties. There it is, 
does it matter that we frame so much of intergenerational family relations in terms of the language of caregiving? That's a question for another day, but it does speak to some of the ways in which our understandings have changed with time. The next slide takes us similarly to think about the biomedical sciences. So the first couple of bullet points here speak to decades now of calls for new ways of thinking and about understanding aging, not focusing on diseases, but aging itself as a focus in terms of a broad spectrum approach, uh, thinking more about preventive approaches for all of the common factors that underlie all those diseases that increase in prevalence with aging. And the next two bullets speak to the concept of gerosciences, so the understanding here is that if we can think about the relationship between a host of biological factors, aging related diseases and other conditions related to quality of life and older age, including the social determinants of health, that's where the notion of gerosciences sits. The belief is that thinking of aging through the lens of geroscience will do for our understanding of aging and later life, what the creation of neurosciences 40 years ago did for our understanding of the brain. So I think a, a challenging uh, idea for those of us who focus on and our, our interest, research interests in aging. The next slide uh, just is a quick salvo to the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, um, and that's helping us address some of these issues. The next slide just reminds us that other things have changed in the period of time that we're talking about research on aging. From advocacy to partnerships, we engage with older people now in research on aging, and uh, that's an important perspective. Nothing about us without us. We do research with, not on older people. So in the next slide, which refers to the work of Malcolm Johnson, a very provocative article he wrote on the social construction of old age as a problem, just wanted to emphasize here that there are very broadly two ways of thinking about old age. One ancient, one modern. Uh, Johnson would say one slightly over that notion of the vulnerable elder. But today, the way we think about aging is often more likely to be framed in terms of apocalyptic demography. It's a catastrophe for society that so many people are aging. Uh, and indeed, many of our uh, policies focus much more on older people now as vulnerable in a way. There's the notion of who assumes risk as people age, very central to some of these contrasting notions. So, in the next slide, we'll see quickly Tom Kirkwood, who spent time, he's from Newcastle, but he spent time here at UBC several years ago, really focuses on this notion of the challenge could become a threat, that we do have to act as a society to recognize that what is unquestionably humanity's greatest success, that is doubling life expectancy in the last 200 years, could become a problem if we don't think about it differently. So when really my last two uh, substantive slides, I just want to give you a bit of a teaser in terms of some of the ways in which we think about aging. And I frame these here because they're largely talked about in binary opposition, but in fact, they represent a continuum. I've alluded to the notion of homogeneity versus heterogeneity. Alluded to the issue of we can focus on the processes of disease, the gerosciences basis versus studying aging exclusively itself. And uh, the notion of high-tech equipment, we have enormous strides in uh, the amount of equipment, medical equipment we've bought, but often in the world of geriatric medicine, for example, it's low-tech, it's people, it's time. The next uh, point emphasizes the increase in life expectancy versus the increase in healthy life expectancy a medical system set up to deal with one acute problem at a time, whereas in fact, most people as they age have multiple chronic conditions that cannot be addressed the way we typically uh, structure modern medicine. The whole notion of the epidemic of dementia versus the, the concept of we're healthier than ever, 70 is the new 60. A few more of these on the next slide, we'll, we'll finish uh, the, this particular presentation again, Considering older people as the source of a problem, 
versus engaging as the source of a solution. Many examples of that. The fantasy of an ageless society, which we constantly hear about, versus pre preparation for old age. I noted this, the concept of population aging as an apocalypse, a catastrophe for society, versus society's greatest achievement. Policy shifts, the individualization of risk, and many examples of that in, in policy framing, from venerable to vulnerable, poverty, lack of financial security versus unprecedented wealth inequity. So they, these all bring us to the last slide with two very contrasting images of old age and later life. If you could just bring that up, that visual on the future is aging. There we are. One, on the one hand, you see these signs all over Europe. One of these pictures was taken in Europe, the other in New Zealand. Very different images of what old age and later life, later life are about. So thanks for your attention, and I look forward to joining with my panel, fellow panelists in discussion of these and other issues. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. That was very interesting. I'm sure we'll have questions for you. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Angie, is there anything you'd like to say or ask? Are you there? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Hi. So, Carolyn, I assume you're inviting uh, Gloria and to ask uh, Anne some some questions. Yes, uh, I am. <laughs> yes. So, so thank you, Anne. That was wonderful. And um, uh, thank you. Introduced a number of concepts that I'll that I'll uh, take up in in my presentation. But um, as I was thinking about how you framed the you know the wonderful aspects of the success of society aging versus some other interpretations of that. I wonder if you could speculate on what is the best thing for universities to do for older Canadians? Should we be uh, designing micro credentials? Uh, should we be helping older Canadians find new, uh, new types of work that might interest them? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that we could spend a lot of time on the on the answer to that question, Angie. So I will just quickly say, from a university perspective, I think Gloria, the work that Gloria's had at Simon Fraser, notwithstanding, it's still the case that you know students don't necessarily a lot of students don't take programs in gerontology. Mm -hmm. Certainly, one of the things that I've done in teaching courses in aging is actually try to encourage a kind of critical thinking about some of these issues. So my classes have always been, often been divided into taking some of these topics and actually structuring them in the form of a debate. Mm -hmm. um, recognize, you know, and then at the end, not doing a traditional term paper, but actually doing a briefing note that's then sent to the seniors advocate for British Columbia. So I think recognizing that these are not just issues that are of kind of intellectual academic interest, but they have real world relevance and application. So the notion of micro credentialing is is interesting. If we could just get more uh, people recognizing, if you think of the planning for the workforce of tomorrow, how would they think about aging broadly and not buying into the, these box ways or parameters uh, of thinking about what aging might be like? Why don't I leave it there? There's a whole other element to your question, but I know our time is limited. Yeah, at, at this point, I'd just like to add, of course, that our many retiree organizations that are um, represented in our meeting today are trying to do their share of, of uh, dealing with the, the wonderful years that we have still after we retire. Mm -hmm. So Gloria, is there something you'd like to add to this discussion? So, um, well, um, I really enjoyed Anne's focusing on the uh, diversity within the seniors population, because certainly I've spent a large part of my career making that argument that some are tall, some are short, some are smart, some are not, and that we need to recognize the, uh, the, the difference within the, the generations and, and within uh, the kinds of skills and vulnerabilities that we bring. But I also, in, in my more recent research, have been working with marginalized populations in particular LGBT and 
uh, two of Canada's largest ethnic minorities, the South Asian seniors and Chinese. And what I want to point out is that there is also diversity within diversity. And we have to be really careful that when we're talking about some of these uh, groups uh, and labeling them as marginalized, that not everybody within those groups are in fact vulnerable. And some are, are very strong and very swift. And there was yesterday, uh, I participated in the uh, conference of the uh, International Union of Health Promotion, Health Education. And in one of the subsections, there was a person from the uh, you know, indigenous community who identified as two spirit. And he said very clearly, he said, I'm not weak. I'm not vulnerable. I have strength. I have resilience. And I have experience to offer. So that message about don't homogenize the older population is just so important. Yeah, brilliant point. And do you have a last word? Before no, we... and I, do, I just want to just pick up on the notion that I didn't even get into issues of the ethnocultural diversity of the population. It's even important to recognize one indicator, of course, not the only one by any means is immigration. And I, we recognize that the proportion of Canadians over the age of 65 who were born with outside Canada is actually greater than it is for the rest of the population. So you cannot talk about aging without recognizing diversity on so many fronts. And we've just identified a few today. Yeah, good point. Okay, that's a good point. Make our transition. Uh, our next speaker will be um, Professor Angela Brooks Wilson, and she's going to talk to us about super agers, super seniors. Uh, so please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, Angela is a professor in both biomedical physiology and kinesiology at SFU and the Department of Medical Genetics at UBC. She's a distinguished uh, scientist at both BC Cancer Research Center and at Canada's Michael Smith Genome Sciences Center. She studies the interaction between genetic susceptibility and environmental triggers and causing lymphoid cancers. Her interest in cancer is complemented by her work on healthy aging and longevity in which she studies these super seniors. She has also worked in the biotechnology industry in Canada and the US. Fittingly, she is currently also Associate VP Research at Simon Fraser University. Angie, we're delighted to have you here today and we're looking forward to hearing about super seniors. Uh, can you tell us just what they are and how they do it? Great, uh, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about super seniors and uh, you may find that it's difficult to get me to stop talking once you get me uh, talking about super seniors. But I'm going to show you a few slides. So I'm gonna share my screen and I hope that you can see that. Uh, so, um, I study, uh, my, my lab group and I and my collaborators, we study what we call super seniors. And as Carolyn said, these are examples of super agers and we study them uh, as a means to gain biological, largely biological insights into what causes uh, healthy aging. Um, it may seem obvious, particularly coming after Anne Martin Matthews uh, in a panel, but why study healthy aging? It's worth mentioning that age is the major risk factor for most common diseases. As Anne said, most, many seniors have multiple chronic conditions. Uh, and it's also important to note that we're studying health span more than lifespan. And of course the two are related to each other, but we're, we're not actually studying who are the people in the world who make it to 120 uh, versus not. We're studying who are the people who make it to um, a lifespan that is not uncommon in, in Canada, 85 years old, but arrive there in exceptionally good uh, health uh, and with good quality of life. So we're really studying health span rather than lifespan. And our hope is that by understanding the lifestyle factors and uh, genetic and biological factors will allow uh, research studies like ours to provide the public with the best possible advice for getting to uh, older age in the best possible shape 
uh, and potentially design interventions to improve human health. So what a super senior is, is someone who is 85 or older, who has never been diagnosed with cancer, cardiovascular disease, major pulmonary disease, diabetes, or dementia. And we don't require to be a super senior. We don't require that someone have no chronic conditions because there, there are a lot of conditions uh, and we might end up with not very many people in the study if we ask that people be completely disease free. But these are the five uh, big, uh, big conditions that are not only the most problematic for, for us as we age, uh, but that are also very costly for our society. And so we've designed the super senior definition with this in mind. We have a couple of groups that we compare super seniors to, depending on the purpose, we compare to a, a middle-aged group for our genetic studies, but not for our, uh, our um, uh, lifestyle and other studies. And we had been collecting a, an over 85 control group with multiple chronic conditions and uh, our collection was disrupted by uh, the pandemic over the last couple of years. But here, I love showing these pictures. These are real super seniors. This is uh, Dal Richards on the left and Olga Kotelko on the right. And um, as you probably know, uh, research studies normally are not able to talk about individual participants. We, we respect confidentiality, but Olga and Dal uh, both enjoy uh, speaking with the press and they, um, they, they have, um, they've talked about being in the study. Uh, Olga, it was written about it in a book about Olga as well. And um, they're very public and proud. Of, they were proud of being members of, this, of the super senior study. So sadly, uh, Del Richards passed away at, I believe he was 98 and Olga at 95 uh, a few years ago but they're examples of people who um, were really, really amazing uh, in, right into their 90s. This picture of Olga was taken when she was approximately 94 years old. And I don't think I can jump the way that she could jump when she was 94. So just a little bit about how we recruited the super seniors. Um, we went from lists from the Ministry of Health uh, lists of people who are over 85 and then and then they were phoned by members of our team and asked uh, if they if they were interested and if they met the study criteria. We went through BC stats who did that same process on our behalf, and we also took volunteers based on press coverage. That was for our first phase and then in a later phase we recruited another 200 supers uh, based on press coverage that we were fortunate to have. Uh, and the, the reporters helped us uh, reach our audience. We also um, assess the health and other aspects uh, of the super seniors. So we, I, send, um, I send a student to their home to interview them. And this is the best job in the lab. I'm, and I was always saying to the students, do you wanna trade jobs? How about you can sit here and write a grant proposal? And I want to go and interview the super seniors. Uh, because the students would always come back with, with stories about how they'd met a wonderful super senior. Uh, and the super seniors were always trying to, to uh, keep the young interviewer uh, in their home as long as possible because the two really uh, had a lot of fun together. And of course, we took a blood sample to do our, our biological analyses. And this was all, of course, with, with informed written informed consent. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the characteristics of the super seniors. This happens to be the data from our phase one. Just to show you their average year of birth was 1916. So uh, they were collected a while ago, average year of birth, 1916. And I show you uh, this in part. One thing that's interesting is their body mass index. So this is a measure of, of um, uh, obesity. Uh, we thought when we began that the supers would, would tend to be very thin. And what we actually found was they had quite a quite an um, a very healthy body mass index. They were not what you would think of as, as skinny by any means. They were uh, a very healthy weight. And uh, it's also interesting that the range of body mass index went from uh, a bit underweight through to uh, well into the obese range. So we had people who were were obese who were still super seniors in spite of it. 
no, I'm not saying that it's necessarily healthy to be obese, but, um, but you can still make it to a super senior in some cases um, if you are. Um, in terms of lifestyle of the super seniors, uh, and although we're not formally comparing these groups, I'm just gonna show them to you uh, in a way because it's a little bit revealing. The controls in the study who were aged 40 to 55 uh, just as a as sort of a, a rough comparison group, and they're mainly for, for genetic studies, 76% of them reported being physically active. Uh, and this is exercising in some way or walking. 80% of the super seniors reported being active. Now you might be thinking, okay, more of the supers are um, more of the supers are retired. So they probably do have more time. The controls are middle-aged, they're right in that that uh, time of life when you're, you're possibly, uh, you know, you're very busy uh, on average. Uh, but still, it's remarkable that the super seniors were, were so active and they did a variety of different, different things. Um, and in addition to being physically active, they were also very busy. And this was really notable when we were trying to make appointments with them to go and interview them. So for example, there was a uh, lady that we had a lot of trouble booking an appointment with because she was so busy organizing her own 100th birthday party that we had to book two months in advance just to get a couple of hours of her time. So she was clearly having a, a very good time. Um, the super seniors, as you, as you might expect, hardly any of them smoked, but a lot of them were former smokers, almost half of them. They grew up at a time when smoking was, was not uncommon, uh, but it's, it's also notable that, that they quit and they went on to be super seniors. So I like to say that this is, a, this is encouraging that people who smoke, who quit, are able to go on and still become uh, super agers. Uh, the, super, the supers also drink, but they drink moderately. So the majority of them drink and an average of three drinks a week includes uh, the numbers from the non-drinkers. Um, the middle-aged group drank a little bit more on average. We also did a number of tests on the super seniors, and I'm not going to belabor these graphs, but they show that in measures like the timed up and go, where the senior stands up, walks across the room and back and sits down, uh, they are fast. So they are high functioning in a physical sense, they retain high cognitive capacity in the mini mental state exam. They have low levels of depression as measured by the geriatric depression scale. And in measures of everyday activity, they have high functional capacity. So they're very capable people uh, and, and they're enjoying life. We asked the supers, what was the age at death of your, of your mother and father? And I wanna acknowledge this, this is subject to some recall bias. Uh, but based on what they reported, their mothers lived to an average of 79 years old and their fathers to 75 years old. Now, if you think about the fact that this group on average is born in 1916, and so their parents might be born in before 1900. And the earliest census data for Canada was 19, 1900. Uh, and so we compared uh, people who were born in 1900, who lived to age 21, which is reproductive age, because we know the parents of the super seniors survive long enough to have kids. So we have to take this into account. When you look at that group born in 1900 and survived to reproductive age, the median age that they reached is 67 years. So the parents of the super seniors lived on average a decade longer than their the 1900, the 1900 birth cohort. And it's probably even more so greater difference when you recognize that probably a lot of those parents were born before 1900 and the lifespan was even shorter as you go back. So um, this longevity, we don't know about their health, but we know about their, their, their longevity runs in the family. And this may mean that they share lifestyle factors they probably do, but it also means that uh, it may also reflect the fact that they share genetic factors as family members. So I'm gonna shift um, gears for just a moment because I'm gonna show you something interesting, which is uh, a direction that we're taking uh, the study going forward. 
So this is work that, that the research group actually did back in 2008, and we're more excited about it uh, than ever before. So if you, some of you may recall that there are structures called telomeres, which are on the ends of chromosomes, on the ends of the, the, the structures of your genetic material. And they kind of, it, it's as if they keep it from unraveling. They promote its integrity. Over our lifetime, our telomeres just naturally shorten. And when we looked at telomere length in the super seniors, our hypothesis was that the super seniors would have telomeres that were long for their age. We didn't think the super seniors telomeres would not shorten with age because that happens to everybody. We just thought they'd be long for their age. And our hypothesis was absolutely wrong. Uh, our, um, well, it was, it was overturned by our data, which is what happens in science. And so the super seniors had telomere lengths that were absolutely average and unremarkable for their age group. However, as a group, the super seniors telomere lengths were less variable than, than in the, the younger group and in other groups. You can see this on the graph here, where you see that the little cloud of data points is tighter in the super seniors, if you can see my cursor over on the right side cluster, and the one on the, on the left, the middle age controls is more diffuse. So we interpreted this as potentially meaning that the super seniors were more tightly clustered toward an optimal telomere length. And so we called this uh, the sweet spot hypothesis. Are they closer to a sweet spot in terms of telomere length? And we later went on uh, more recently to show that if you compare blood cell counts and blood cell properties between a group of senior sen super seniors and a, a group of, of other seniors, um, the same sweet spot effect seems to hold up for, for many other measures that relate to blood cell counts. So we think that this is a general thing where people who are very healthy tend to be closer to optimal values for certain physiological measures that are important for healthy aging. And we are going on to do a much larger study that looks at this, and we're actually using the data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, which Anne was, was instrumental uh, in getting going. And last, uh, the last thing I wanna tell you is just a little bit about genetics. I'm a geneticist and this is intended to be largely a genetic study. Don't get too bogged down in, in uh, the numbers here. Um, the take home message is that there are uh, certain um, disease related uh, and condition related things like the APOE4 marker, uh, which is more common in people who have Alzheimer's disease. And when we look at a marker like that, we see as expected that it is less common in super seniors than in the general population. Now this makes sense. The super seniors are a group who do not have dementia. And so they have a lower frequency of carrying a genetic variant that is associated with dementia. However, the thing that's intriguing is down at the bottom here, the box containing 77, seven and four. There are 88 super seniors here which do carry the APOE4 variant. And four of them have two copies of it. And yet they still went on to be super seniors. What this illustrates is a, is a general thing. And it's that sure you have genetics, but you also have lifestyle and other things and lifestyle can modify uh, or offset the effects of genetics. And you have many genes in your genome. And so sometimes there are other genes in the genome that moderate the effects of a, of, a, of a given variant. And so it's actually complex and having any one variant does not determine uh, your outcomes or how well that you're going to age. And it also gives us uh, a handle toward asking the question, what, it, what else is it about these 88 super seniors? What else is it in their genome? What else is it in their lifestyle that let them go on to be super seniors despite carrying this known um, Alzheimer locus. So in conclusion, um, I've just told you the supers are, are really high functioning in a variety of sense. 
lifestyle, probably particularly physical activity, probably pl plays a big role in their long-term good health. But their parents live longer than than you'd expect at the time, and so it's possibly uh, there's probably genetics underlying this as well. We're, and going forward, we're looking at um, the physiological measures for which they are closer to to sweet spots. Uh, and you could argue that this is a this is a uh, this is an application of general science, as Anne introduced to you previously. So um, I'm going to just say thank you, uh, and I will stop sharing now. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much. That was so interesting. Um, and um, I hope we'll get to hear back from you in a few more years to find out what's new as those data keep coming in. So uh, Gloria, is there anything you'd like to ask or, or comment on here? Well, I just think it's so interesting that we're revisiting now the nature versus nurture uh, discussions, which when I started out as, as a young student was a hot topic. And I remember uh, at one point in my career of being in Japan with an expert in biology of aging, and we were talking about the issues of nature versus nurture. And what he said to me was, you know, we have in animal colonies where we can control the genetics, we mm -hmm. can control the environment, and still there's a percentage that are unpredictable. And he called that the luck factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, pr I presume you've seen that in, in your research as well. Well, um, it, it's harder to tell because, our, our, of course, you could, you could refer to our population as a free-living wild population in the sense rather than a, a, a controlled, like the colony that you, that you described, Gloria. But um, when you look at the, uh, a lot of the animal studies, you, see, you do see that heterogeneity in, in outcomes is exactly despite what you said. There's a range of, um, of lifespans in a, in a colony. Uh, that it, despite it being really, really uniform. So I, I'm sure that those effects are, are in, our, in our human populations as well. It's just harder to see. So what we tend to do is we tend to do studies that correlate, correlate lifestyle with lifespan or health and correlate genetics with lifespan and health. And then when you have enough people and a large enough sample size, you can ask about combinations of the lifestyle and, and the, the genetics as well. So those are what the big, big studies are doing. Great, Anne, is there, would you like to just, chime in? Yes, just quickly, I, th I thought, first of all, Angie, really interesting and uh, quite uh, surprising in many ways, the work on telomeres, because as you were presenting, I had literally written down a question about mm -hmm. telomere length. And if you think of the work of Barzillai and others with the super, now they're talking about super centenarians mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. some of his work at the Einstein Center, but whether, you know, as people go on that group that survive even longer than your, uh, than your super seniors group might Th that be where some of the differences in telomere lengths play out, but fascinating work. R really quick question. I note that you looked at the ethnicity, uh, mm -hmm. the background of the people in the study. And of course, there is that argument about the healthy immigrant effect, mm -hmm. that you have to be healthy in mm -hmm. order to be accepted as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. Did you see any evidence of that or is it too soon yet with your data? Was that a, to see whether that was a factor in the analysis that you did? Oh, it, you know, it's it's very hard to say, Anne. And uh, in a way, we were we were a little uh, we were pragmatic, but a little disappointed that our study didn't end up being more diverse than it was. Okay. Um, I we felt that there was um, there was definitely a bias in who was willing to participate in the study. Uh, and at at one point, we translated all our materials into standard written Chinese. And we recruited in, in uh, more than two languages and um, advertised in, in uh, sort of community newspapers. And we did not get a lot of uptake. So our numbers are actually small okay. uh, and it's hard to say, but yes, the, I would expect that the healthy immigrant effect is part of it in, in okay. those groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Angie. Okay. Um, 
Angie, would you like to say anything else as we wrap up this part? Um, uh, no, thank you. I'm just really looking forward to Gloria's presentation. Yeah, as we all are. <laughs> so Gloria is our final speaker in this session. And um, just to tell you a little bit about her, uh, she developed the Gerontology Research Center and the Department of Gerontology at Simon Fraser University, and she was director of both from 1982 to 2005. So currently she's Professor Emerita and a Research Associate at SFU, as well as Vice President of the International Longevity Center Canada and President of the North American Chapter of the International Society for Gerontology. In addition, she's past president of the Canadian Association on Gerontology, the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics, and the International Network for Prevention of Elder Abuse. Gloria's awards and honors include an honorary doctor of law at Western University, the Order of British Columbia, and the Queen Elizabeth II um, Diamond Jubilee Medal. Um, she was named a member of the Order of Canada for her work as an international authority in the field of gerontology. Her interests in research include seniors housing, long-term care, health promotion, gerontechnology, geron prevention of elder abuse, advanced care planning, and seniors and disasters. Um, she's the author or editor of 23 books. So Gloria, take it away. Tell us about our environments and what we can do. <laughs> well, I was asked to talk about or to respond to the question, how can we modify our environment to better accommodate us as we age? Next slide, please. And what I wanted to point out, first of all, was that the majority of seniors want to age in place, and the majority of seniors are living in community. At any point in time, only about 5% of seniors live in care facilities, and there might be maybe another 10% who are living at home with major restrictions on their mobility. But that leaves 85% who are doing most of what they want to do most of the time, and living in conventional housing. But it's important for us to note that 80% of accidents, whether we're talking about falls, cuts, burns, occur in the home. And for many years, we've known that there are things about the way our environment is structured uh, that put us a bit at risk. You know, the, uh, if, if you go into hospital, an OT will be sent out to your home afterward, and they'll look around to see what are the hazards and the things like, like uh, rugs that you can trip over. There are, uh, in some, for some people, stairs are a problem. And it's not so much the fact that there are stairs, but rather that there aren't railings on both sides of the stairs. So if they're a little bit wobbly, they haven't got the right things to hang on to. Uh, also, for years and years and years, we've known that there are problems with uh, stairs and the way they are marked, the way they are, the risers and um, lighting is a big issue. So Canada Mortgage and Housing is our authority on housing. Uh, as it says on this slide, it, it contributes to, to the housing market, the stability of it, uh, supports Canadians in housing needs and so on. But it also has a tremendous number of publications that are available on how you can make your home safer and how uh, things that you can do to improve your, your physical environment in the house. And you know, some really simple things are that uh, in the case of, of uh, housing with children, you want to have the controls for your stove at the back so the little kids can't turn them on. In the case of seniors, it's better to get a stove where the controls are in front so that you don't have to reach across 
with and and where there's a chance that your bathrobe might uh, or your nighty might get ignited by the burners because you're reaching across and you don't reach as high as you used to when you were younger. So I really would encourage people to go to the CMHC website and click on it. Uh, next slide. There is a whole section there on seniors housing. Uh, it will tell you about things, uh, 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 the housing for older Canadians, the options for uh, people who are living with dementia. You know, Anne Martin Matthews mentioned that there are a subset of people with, with dementia. Uh, we know that our super seniors have fewer of them, but still there's a sizable subgroup that are people living with dementia. And what we now know is that, that uh, if the environment can be modified so that they can manage better, and, so, and there's some automated things that can happen uh, in their housing that will enable them to stay in the community for much longer and to be independent. And you know, we see here the third bar at the bottom of this slide says seniors independence. That's the key thing that we all want is to be independent for as long as possible. Independent or if we're semi-independent, at least where we have some control over the way we want to live. Next slide. I wanna draw your attention also to Health Canada. Uh, Many of you may not know that Health Canada has an environmental health program that promotes safe and healthy living, and it raises awareness of particular environmental uh, risks in the area of chemicals, radon, and air quality. I live in a house. You're seeing uh, the study in my house right now. I live in a two-story house with a full basement. And I hadn't thought about the idea that I should have a, 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 radar, a, a radon check, be aware of the potential uh, health risks from uh, exposure. And we need to test our homes and make sure we, we reduce radon levels if necessary. Uh, in terms of chemical management, many of us have, uh, if we've lived in our house for a while, we've got cans of old paint, paint thinner, uh, different kinds of solvent, many chemicals that are not stored as safely as they should be. And where we're exposing ourselves to chemicals that could be harmful to us. So I would encourage you to go to the Health Canada's environmental health program materials and read about what you can do to make sure that your house is safe in terms of, of chemical management. And also uh, we wanna think about issues of air quality. You know, these days we're hearing much more about climate change and with climate change, you're getting changes in the quality of the air out there. We need to be aware in summertime of heat warning warnings. We also need to be aware and listen to the air quality messages that are coming over our TV or our, our uh, radio. And that tell us that some days older people or people with, with compromised uh, um, cardiopulmonary uh, or lung problems shouldn't go out that day in the air and that we're better to stay indoors than to go uh, expose ourselves when there's a lot of smog or um, uh, particles in the air. Next slide. I also want to draw your attention to some international resources. Um, in particular, the WHO Age-Friendly Communities Network. Uh, this has been around since 2005. It was, it's a concept that my friend Alex Kalachi, from, uh, who was the head of the seniors uh, directorate within WHO, 
uh, for many years and headquartered in Geneva. Well, we, I was at a conference in Brazil where Alex said, you know, I think we should have some work done on and looking at how to make our our cities, because it started out with cities, not and it's been broadened now into the idea of communities. How do we make them more edge friendly? And the uh, um, there was a whole set of research studies that were conducted. And these were bottom up, where we went and talked to seniors to find out about things in their own community that they found were hazards and other things that they thought were protective factors for their lifestyle. And this led to the Age-Friendly Communities Network, which now uh, encompasses worldwide many communities, large and small. There's another movement out there called the Compassionate Cities Movement. And this one, uh, if you go to the website, the, the, the UK one is probably the best of the websites for information. And the Compassionate Cities is, is uh, uh, drawing our attention to the need to be sensitive to people who are having losses in their family and to help people cope with some of the losses of, of friends and relatives that take place in uh, as we get older. And then there's the whole dementia-friendly communities. And that's been a more recent kind of uh, movement and one in which Canada has played a major role and where we know that, they, like I said before, people there are people living with dementia, living much longer in the community and they can continue to do so if they get a bit of help from their friends and neighbors and from the commercial uh, offerings in their neighborhood. So when you go to the grocery store, if the clerks know that, that uh, there's older people and it's taking them a little longer to get their money out, to make the decisions of what they're purchasing and so on, and particularly that those who are uh, with, with dementia are going to have a little harder time at that. Uh, we can make it much better for people to be able to stay in their homes for much longer. And then there's also the WHO Healthy Cities Movement, which wasn't particularly focused on older people, but rather on making our cities more healthy. So I would encourage you to look into all of those groups if you want to get involved uh, in your own community in making it more age friendly or more compassionate or dementia friendly. These are things that we as older people and as ex-academics certainly could um, do and contribute. And, you know, it was interesting. I heard John Halliwell's talk earlier this morning, and John was talking about that people who donate, to, uh, whether it's donating money or donating your time as a volunteer, are people who generally are happier. And I would bet that we would see that some of those, those kinds of characteristics uh, in some of the super uh, edgers that Angela was talking about. Next slide. Oh, okay. Well, we seem to have lost. <laughs> we seem to have lost my PowerPoint with them with the last bit. I wanted to draw your attention to this particular slide because uh, what it it shows in this flower are the components of age-friendly cities. And so, you know, it's not just housing, but it's also social participation, uh, having respect for other people and, and including them. So being inclusive rather than exclusive, uh, the ability to participate. And if you want to work, to be able to work, something that is fulfilling. There's the whole issue of communication and information. There's lots of information out there, but some seniors 
are precluded from getting that because they're not techno savvy. They don't know how to use Zoom or how to search on the internet. So obviously this audience is more uh, techno uh, sophisticated, but we need to remember in terms of communication and information that some people still get their major information from the TV, from the radio, or from the newspaper. And it was interesting this last little uh, couple of days, uh, I had um, I was going out of town for a few days, so I had had, had uh, decided to stop my newspaper. And then my plans changed and I came back sooner. So I thought, well, I'll, uh, I, as a subscriber to The Sun, I have access to the, uh, the e-version of it. So rather than phoning up and saying, well, send me my paper paper, uh, I'll spend a couple of days and read my paper on my computer. It ain't the same. It's not the same as having the, the paper in front of you where you can read from beginning to end. You can uh, um, it, and find what you want. So we need to have both e-communication, but also some old fashioned um, booklets, newspapers, um, and ways of, of communicating our information. Of course, we've got community support and health services are important components of age-friendly cities, as well as outdoor spaces and buildings. And you know, more and more of, of us uh, over this COVID period have taken up walking and being outside and taking advantage of our outdoor spaces, which certainly uh, there's everything that, that I know that says being outside, being active, being in the fresh air, and, and social distancing is still a good idea as we're still coming out of this pandemic. So it's, you know, we need to return to a more normal way of life, but still to be careful and to think about these kinds of issues and including transportation. You, know, you have to be able to get to places uh, and more of us will be using public transportation given the high cost of gas these days. But we have to make sure that that public transportation is in fact accessible. And there's lots of design guidelines on that issue as well. Next slide. So finally, I would like to draw your attention to a conference that's coming up June the 2nd. Um, it's our 29th John K. Friesen Conference. Those of you in the Vancouver area may well have attended in the past. It's two years since we've had one. We're not doing it face-to-face -face this year. Next year we will, but I uh, encourage you to go to the website and take a look. It's really going to be a very interesting program. The first half of it will be concerned with the standards that are being uh, examined, both the phys for physical environments in long-term care and also the standards for operation in long-term care. The afternoon part of this program is going to be concerned with issues of elder abuse in, uh, in facilities, in seniors' housing, and uh, also some new data that will be presented uh, from research I've been doing using the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And we really have to take our hats off to Anne Martin Matthews because she was the chair of the um, CIHR uh, Institute of Aging and, and in that role pushed very hard for this national treasure, which is the CLSA. So on that a uh, uh, self-serving note to publicize our conference. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for this opportunity to chat with you today. Well, thank you, Gloria. That was very interesting. It looks we have a, a lot of homework to do, and I suspect you'll get some attendees at your conference. I'll certainly
try to go uh, for sure. Anyway, let's see if, um, Anne, do you have any comments or questions you'd like to? Well, thanks for the shout out to the, <laughs> yeah. uh, on the CLSA to both Angie and Gloria. That's always terrific to see it being used. That's always what you hope for when you work hard to get a longitudinal data set established. And it was a huge initiative, but that is actually being used by people. That's wonderful. Uh, Gloria, I was thinking as you were talking and certainly in terms of the whole age-friendly cities, age-friendly communities initiative, that uh, some of the people uh, attending this conference might be interested to know that one of the ideas behind uh, the age-friendly city movement was to actually develop criteria by which municipalities could actually you know, get designated as age-friendly or not. And I know there was a time when one would actually see municipalities advertising in that way. Has that continued at, you know, where an actual checklist was developed and so you could act, uh, well, yeah. organizations about have a way of knowing, is, is this up to standard in terms of what it has to well, do? Yeah. yeah, and it's an important distinction because it's not that they were designated by anybody else as okay, age friendly, yeah. but rather that the communities use the checklist to tick off and to see where they are in the process. So in the network of age-friendly cities, there are people at different stages. And in Canada, and particularly in BC, one of our innovations was to actually recognize that people start at different points and to give some recognition. So it was if you got better, you got uh, a prize. You know, if that's what in, in teaching kids, and you reward them for that kind of effort. And this is, is the, the, it applies to us at any age. If we improve something about our lifestyle or our environment, reinforce the small steps. Thank you, because that, that that's important. For sure. Angie, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks so much, Gloria. Always wonderful to, to, to uh, hear from you. Um, occasionally, we have invited Gloria to give uh, lectures to our classes at SFU, which is always a treat as well. So it kind of feels like that. Um, but your, your last slide and the conference that you told the audience about, uh, Gloria, it seems like such an important thing, um, care across the, the continuum. I'm wondering, what is... What's your what's your your comment on the role of advocacy? Um, and I'm I'm thinking recently of uh, an experience um, assisting my uh, my father recently and advocating while he was in a in a hospital, and how that was much more difficult than I expected it to be. Uh, and I, it made me wonder what do seniors do who don't have an an advocate uh, who's a family member. So uh, yeah, is, do you have wisdom on the role of advocacy in the in uh, in supporting older Canadians? Well, ad advocacy is something I think Anne and I have done throughout our careers, and you know others that are in leadership positions within the gerontological community in this country and internationally have worked really hard to try to raise awareness of some of the issues that are problematic and ways of solving them. And, and you know, with, with what uh, somebody said, you know, that the, I think it was Winston Churchill that, that talked about using a disaster uh, to, for positive reasons. And certainly, you know, we, with COVID, it's illuminated issues that we've known for years were problematic in long-term care. So we, uh, we want to make sure that those stay on the front burner and that they get addressed mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and hopefully things get better. That's why you know, we call this, this upcoming conference, mm -hmm. how to make it better and safer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, any, any final comments, Gloria, or any of the rest of you actually? Well, one thing I'll just quickly jump in and say, I think 
when Angie was to Angie's question as well, touches on the really important issue, not just of advocacy at that broad professional level, but the roles that individuals may find themselves in with members of their families. Mm -hmm. And I'll just quickly say, I think this has been an issue for people for so long. And Mm -hmm. I ended up with a career in gerontology for numbers of reasons, but one of them was living with an elderly widowed woman without children in Hamilton, Ontario in 1971, just Mm -hmm. taking a flat in her home and real realizing that she lived amongst a community of older, predominantly women in the Westdale area of Hamilton, how they supported one another as a network. But I actually ended up going to physician's appointments with her and just helping her feel comfortable dealing Mm -hmm. with the bureaucracy of the medical profession and having another set of ears to hear what a physician was even saying or that the directive that would be given at that time. So that that's a role that many family members feel they don't have any you know, qualifications for, but it is one that that individuals do get thrust into very much. So I think that's important to recognize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Anne. I think how how to do that well uh, and how to how to help other people do it effectively who might not uh, realize how to approach it uh, is important. Uh, it makes me think of some of the the programs I've heard about, and I suspect that you and Gloria know much more about this uh, programs that that might. Um, pair students with seniors in living arrangements to both uh, help the senior, but also uh, provide housing, which is hard to come by for some students. Uh, So when you get the right pair together, it's probably wonderful. So um, mm -hmm. absolutely. on that note, I'll just uh, alert people that there is a group out there uh, that you can find if you Google it called Cyber Seniors. And that actually does pair uh, young techies with older people. And it's phenomenal. I mean, if if you want to know how to make your computer work better or how to to deal with Spotify or various of these things that are out there, uh, the kids are really good at helping. So, and one of the things, again, silver lining of COVID mm-hmm. is the extent to which uh, intergenerational activities have occurred where younger people have helped older people. Also, uh, the way in which the faith community has stepped up to the plate has been really quite dramatic. And we hope that these things continue. Mm-hmm. So I would certainly encourage people to yeah, help your neighbors, um, be willing to accept graciously if your neighbors want to help you, because <laughs> that's the other side of it, right? <laughs> And, and, you know, so that's, that's one thing about being a very small person, that uh, when I'm on an airplane, I always have to ask somebody, would you mind putting my bag up? There's no way I could do it. Right. So I've learned to do that. And, and often people are happy to have an opportunity to give you a hand. Yeah, I have to come in with a personal story there because um, we have two young people in our next door neighbor household who are lovely, lovely people. But we were quite discombobulated when they kept volunteering to shovel our snow or <laughs> off the sidewalks and things. And we were quite offended that we were seen as old enough to need that kind of help. But I'll have to look at it with different eyes now and be more gracious. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other? Okay. I think maybe now we'll just move to... Thanks, Gloria. That was just great. And thanks for everybody's comments. Um, We'll move now to our questions. Um, We have a number and we probably won't get to them all, but um, Randy Barkhouse asks, are there examples of jurisdictions that have implemented public policies to mitigate intergenerational conflict over the uh, draw on public services? Well, the, the, the issue of intergenerational uh, conflict is much more an American concept than it is a Canadian uh, experience. And it, uh, I think it's been blown out of proportion. 
and that that if anything, you know, that they there is quite a bit of uh, intergenerational communication and, like I said, systems that we've certainly seen through this COVID period. And I don't know that there's municipalities that specifically have um, targeted this. Yeah, in terms of, I'm just saying it's an interesting question because uh, I'm more out of touch but I, uh, on this issue, but I know years ago, for example, being, uh, being in Winnipeg, and speaking with individuals who were sort of working in areas of older people and, and aging there, that they certainly were uh, were engaged. And I think this comes back to Gloria's notion of age-friendly communities, of, of uh, having neighborhoods which were particularly supportive of people. I'm not focusing on the intergenerational conflict question as specifically as, as was presented to us, but certainly in terms of supportive, supportive environments for people. And I've recently become aware of the concept, I hadn't heard it before, NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities. But there is this notion, there are even buildings, I mean, you will often find older apartment buildings where there will be a higher proportion of people over the age of 65, people who are whatever, people who have lived there for a long time. And often those become mutually supportive environments amongst the relatives, including those who come and go, family and friendship ties, et cetera. So this concept, I think, of NORCs, however prevalent that may be, speaks to some of the, some of the uh, elements, I think, that are, that are embedded in that question. Yeah, um, and in, in London, Ontario, uh, actually, I did research uh, with a colleague there, and we've written up a, uh, an article on uh, a NORC situation, but that was where the university uh, the people had uh, set up a, a, a like a community center and some nursing stations and uh, uh, various support services in the uh, supermarket and the uh, the mall that was very close to this conglomeration of high rise buildings. So yeah, what happened? What NORCs, so NORCs is not an, a, a new concept, but it's been it, it's come more into attention these days in terms of labeling. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, um, Judith Hall would like to know whether over sixty five is a new evolutionary stage leading to better survival. <laughs> Maybe I can take a crack at, at that one. Great. Um, Thank you, Andrew. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't think of it exactly like that. I mean, but but it's it's a really good question uh, that Judy asks. Um, if you if you think about the effect of of grandparents, uh, I, I mean, if you were to think of a, a population of animals in the wild, do, if if the um, you know, does the does the grandparent have an effect on the survival of not only their offspring but the but the offspring's offspring? Um, I mean, you can. It's kind of a hypothetical thing to think about, but um, I, I would argue that they there definitely is. So um, maybe the the senior doesn't affect their well. Maybe they affect their own longevity. It's post reproductive longevity, of, of course, mm -hmm. but if you you may affect the success and and survival of your offspring. I know um, anecdotal examples from from neighbors and friends where grandparents have stepped in and made made a very huge difference uh, in the life of a grandchild whose parent was was having a very tough time. Um, And did you want to add? Yeah, anything? I don't know that I would think of it as new. I, I don't know that I have the skill set to determine in evolutionary terms whether I would classify it that way, Judy. But certainly we know that historically it is unprecedented, uh, not only for so many people, such a significant proportion of the population to live to 65, but as I was noting, to live so many years beyond 65. Mm -hmm. So we are, as a society, negotiating new roles and relationships for people in the multiple generations that we now have beyond uh, beyond 65. But I'd be interested in someone closer to Angie's field and expertise to actually speak, you know, what are the evolutionary implications for that? But, but a fascinating question. Yeah. 
And, and a fascinating uh, question to follow on, on on Anne's take on the question. Um, I would actually say that the cultural aspects are, are so huge. When you say, Anne, that there, it, there are more generations on the planet at the same time, and you think about how culturally different uh, the time was for the, the oldest uh, current generation and the youngest generation, I mean, I, I could argue that I hardly, uh, that I don't fully understand my own millennial students. Um, and uh, my millennial daughter certainly insists that I don't understand her. Uh, so, <laughs> but I, I would argue that her grandparent maybe does a better job of understanding her. So, so uh, it's maybe not linear, but yeah, a lot of cultural differences in our current mix. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, I have a question from Douglas Clayton, who says, what I missed in these presentations is the issue of gender. Is the research gender blind? And are any variations observed based on the gender of the subjects? I don't know, maybe Gloria, you could start off with this one. Well, in, in the uh, WHO, uh, um, the concepts that were um, articulated in this thing called active aging, right? The cross-cutting variables are gender and culture. And so we really do need to look at uh, all of our services, all of our, our regulations, um, various th things that we're um, researching and looking at other differences rather than, and again, this goes back to Anne's point about don't homogenize. Mm -hmm. you know, things that are good for guys are not necessarily <laughs> the same thing as for, for gals. And some of you um, in this audience may have been at the conference that was held a couple of weeks ago by the United Way Seniors uh, Program. And the, uh, certainly the, the issue came up uh, there about um, uh, culture and, and gender, right? And um, it's really important to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. and, and in that, uh, you know, the workshop that they had uh, right before the United Way was on something called men's sheds. And this is a concept that was started out in New Zealand, I believe, and it's, it's now worldwide, but it's recognizing that guys need a place to go where they can, can be convivial with one another and where they do workshops or woodworking or the, the kind of things that guys like. Mm -hmm. I'm glad for the question, actually, uh, because in fact, so much of the research, as, as Gloria and Angie both know, it, it looks, looks the, 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 through the gender lens, that the experience of later life in many ways is very different for men and for women. Um, uh, I made reference to the distinction between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. And we know that the data continue to show, although the gap is, redu is reducing as women are, you know, in, in stressful occupations, increasingly, et cetera. But the, the, uh, certainly women are continuing to outpace men in terms of life expectancy. One of the very interesting factors, however, is that those extra years that women gain in life, life expectancy are not uniformly healthy life years. Mm -hmm. So women in fact will have typically more chronic health conditions in later life. But in a memorable phrase, and I quote this with my students all the time, a, a former colleague, now long deceased, but, but loved and remembered colleague of Gloria's, Ellen G. As Ellen G. said in her book with Meredith Kimball, women get sick, but men die. Um, and it's just, it's a reflection of the fact that when you look at later life, I do research on widowhood in later life, that widows outnumber widowers by five to one. The uh, population of most long-term care facilities is overwhelmingly female. So absolutely to the, to the question, there are huge gender issues in the understanding of aging, and I'm glad to have it raised for Thank discussion. You. 
Right. And just to add from the biological side, um, yes, that's a really good question. And, and thank you for asking that. Um, we analyze everything um, separately by men and women, broken into age groups, um, looking at different eth group, ethnicity groups, not to assume that things are uniform where the, where the sizes of the groups weren't. So definitely we make no assumption that men are, and women are the same with the bio biology, but it's more when you, have a, when you have a 10 to 15 minute presentation, you simplify. So that's what you heard in <laughs> the overall stuff. So I think you've you've um, sort of alluded to the limits of our time here, which has just been absolutely wonderful. We are at the end of our time, and clearly we have lots more to talk about. So we may have to reconvene you at some point in the future. So that's fair warning. In the meantime, we thank you so much for being here today. It was just an absolutely fascinating um, session, and I apologize to the people whose questions that we didn't get to. So um, with that, we are coming to the end of our time together, which has been wonderful. And um, we are thankful for our many colleagues from coast to coast to coast who have joined us today. And um, I, of course, I need to thank people before we leave because there's so many people who made this possible. First of all, all the speakers. So John, you weren't in this session, but we do thank you too. And um, to Ken who introduced you. And um, this event, we want to say um, thank you um, to the local organizing committee and the joint efforts of UBC Emeritus College and Simon Fraser University's Retiree Association and the University of Victoria's Retiree Association and the CURAC Conference Committee. So thank you all. And a very special thanks to the Emeritus College staff. Um, who have worked so hard and without them, we certainly couldn't have done this at all. I remember back to the days when we were just um, uh, about completely volunteer without any staff. And I, we certainly just couldn't have done this then. And we also thanks to CCR Solutions for their technical expertise. I think things went very smoothly today. And of course, many thanks to our generous sponsors. So we hope we will see you all again next year at the Curat Conference, and uh, perhaps even in person. So thanks again and farewell.